Okay, so we have just had a look at the sutta on old age. So now we're going to have a look at the next one. This is a sutta on sensual pleasures. And uh, it is important to remember that when we talk about the idea of sensual pleasures, what we often mean by that are the things in the world, yeah, the things that we attach to in the world. Sometimes people think that sensual pleasure means the desires, the desire that people have inside of them. But very often it actually refers to the objects that we desire in the world, the things that we desire, yeah, the, the partner that we desire, the house that we desire, the car, the whatever it is in the world. Yeah. So this is an important background here. So let's have a quick look at this. I will read through it first of all, and then we can make some comments afterwards. Yeah? If a mortal desires sensual pleasures, uh, sensual objects, uh, and their desire succeeds, uh, they definitely become elated, having got what they wanted. But for that person in the throes of pleasure, aroused by desire, if those pleasures fade, it hurt. It hurts like an arrow's strike. One who, being mindful, avoids sensual pleasures, like sidestepping a snake's head, transcends attachment to the world. There are many objects of sensual desire, fields, lands and gold, cattle and horses, slaves and servants, women and relatives. When a man lusts over these, the weak, overpower him and adversities crush him. Suffering follows him like the water in a leaky boat. That is why a person ever mindful should av avoid sensual pleasures, give them up and cross the flood as a bailed out boat reaches the far shore. So let's have a look at this. It's a very short poem, and it's quite uh, quite easy to uh, we should go through it. So let's have a quick look at it. Yeah. So if a mortal desires sensual pleasures and their desire succeeds, yeah, they feel elated because they get what they want, and this is typical of humanity. We are going into the world. We are searching out the pleasures in the world. We get that partner we want, yeah, we get that husband, we get that wife or boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever it is, yay, I, I su succeeded, or we get the house that we want, or we get the car that we want, we get the job that we want, we get the raise what we want, the promotion, we get the status in society that we desire. All of these things are kinds of sensual things, there are worldly things that we hold on to in the world. And when we desire, we feel elated at least for a short time, yeah? You feel elated for a short time and then the ordinary life reasserts itself uh, and the whole thing kind of becomes empty very, very quickly. And then you need another raise, uh, then you need another promotion, then you need another house, another car, more, 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 always more, never being satisfied. And the reason why you are never satisfied is because the deep, yearning from inside, the yearning to feel complete, the yearning to feel like a full person has not been satisfied. The whole inside is still there. And because the whole inside is still there, craving will come back again. It always comes back. The problem is that it is a psychological problem that we have. Yeah, every one of us, it's a psychological feeling of not being complete, of not being satisfied. And if you try to fill that psychological hole with external things, it can never fill that psychological hole. It can just maybe relieve you for a short time. You feel elated for a short time, but because it is a deep psychological lack, it will come back again. Craving will reassert itself and you never find a solution in that way. Still, you feel elated for a while. And then the Buddha goes on, but for that person in the throes of pleasure, aroused by desire, if those pleasures fade, it hurts like an arrow's strike. 
Yeah, if you find the a good partner in life and then the partner leaves you or they die or whatever happens, yeah. If you find a nice house, but the house burns down or the burglars steal the house or they take the keys from your car or they, whatever it is, you get fired from the company, even though you have worked really, really hard. You haven't been lazy like some of these other people that were asked about in the question. You actually worked really hard, but you were not appreciated. And because you're not appreciated, you still get fired from that job. Maybe the people didn't like you. Who knows what the reason is? All of these things, the pleasures of the world fade. You were wealthy and then you lose all your money on the stock market. Happens all the time. What happens when these things occur? Well, then you feel the sense of pain that happens from losing the things that were very important to you. The downside of the sensual objects of the world become obvious. Yeah. The downside is that once you attach to these things, the more elated you are when you get them, the more problems you're going to have when they have to go again in the future. All of these things, remember what I said, they are borrowed things. You have them for a while and then you have to let go of them again in the future. You know it's going to be a problem. So the more elated you are when you get these things, the greater is going to be the downfall when eventually they have to go. All of these pleasures are like that. It's like being struck in the heart by an arrow. We were talking about the darts before. The Buddha says very interestingly that when we enjoy the sensual pleasures of the world, it is like we are, uh, we are taking up a loan. Yeah? When you take up a loan, you have to pay back the debt later on. This is the nature of sensual pleasures. Because once you attach to something in that sensory world, you know that sooner or later you are going to have to give it up. And because you're going to have to give it up, that is where the debt has to be paid back. So these are always problematic. There's never any certainty in the external world. And the more you understand that, the more you realize that the real freedom from all of those things has to be found inside. If you want to feel full, if you want to feel complete, if you want to fill up the lack within you, the hole that is inside of you, the part of your personality that doesn't feel complete, the way to do that is by inner development. When you develop your inner life in that right way, that is when you find real satisfaction. That thing that you were searching for through acquiring objects outside, that very thing you find not by gaining those objects, but by practicing the spiritual path, by practicing meditation. One day you do feel complete. You feel, wow, this is it. This is what I was always looking for. Now I've got it. What happened? Why was I so foolish in looking in the wrong place all the time? I was always looking in the wrong place. Now I have found it in a very different place by practicing the spiritual path. That's why the Buddha says one, being mindful avoids sensual pleasures, uh, like sidestepping a snake's head. They transcend the attachment to the world. It's hard to understand, isn't it? Uh, the idea that we should avoid attachment to the sensual pleasures of the world uh, is like sidestepping a snake's head. Okay, it's hard to <laughs> gain that understanding, isn't it? Because it does feel so benign. What's wrong with having a nice relationship? What's wrong with having a nice job? Actually, there's nothing wrong with those things at all. The problem with those things is the attachment that we have. Please have a good relationship. Please have a good job. Please have a nice house. Have all of those things, but beware of the attachment that comes with those things. When you see the downside, you sidestep that, like you sidestep a snake said, because you understand the downside. So you transcend the attachment to the world. If you take this far enough, it ends up with what? It ends up with renouncing. It ends up with giving up the world and really becoming a monk or a nun because you understand actually there isn't all that much to be had with these things at all. It's kind of powerful, isn't it? And it's very hard for people to see here, but it's, it's kind of, it sort of starts to make sense when you read about these things. At least I hope it makes sense. I hope I'm not being a killjoy for pointing this out to you. 
Maybe I'm being a little bit of a killjoy, but maybe being a killjoy is a good thing. Yeah? Maybe the Buddha was a little bit of a killjoy. Yeah? But if you can kill a lower joy, and killing that lower joy allows you to access something higher, then it's worth it, right? So hopefully this is the path to accessing something higher. And if it is, then it is really worthwhile. The Buddha says there are many objects of sensual desire. Fields, lands, gold, cattle and horses, slaves and servants, women and relatives. Yeah, these are all the objects in, of the world that kind of uh, we desire. It says women here, of course. This is ancient India. You might as well put men in there as well. It's the same thing. It doesn't matter what it is. And when a person, not just a man, any person, lusts over these things, in other words, desires these things, then what happens? Then the weak overpower that person. The adver adversities crush him. And suffering follows him like water in a leaky boat. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? If you are overwhelmed by all of these things in the world, when you lust for all of these, these kind of things, when you desire all of these kind of things, you become weak. Yeah, you're no longer independent in the world because you rely on external things. It means that the world has a way of manipulating you. The world can hold back yeah, what you desire and the world can give you a little bit to kind of get you wet your appetite for these things and the world can control you. This is what we mean by Mara controlling people. The Mara has you in his grip, in his power. The Mara can drag you around because you are attached to the things of the world and those things of the world are always out of control. You become weak inside. You don't have the strength to stand your ground. Yeah? You don't have the independence in the world which you gain when you become a noble one or your meditation is very deep because you are addicted to the things of the world. And then the adversities crush you. Yeah? The adversities here does, does not just mean like uh, you know the kind of the enemies in the world or the people who invade your country or whatever. The adversities here can mean anyone who wants to control you. They have you in their grip. Yeah, They have a noose around your neck and they can pull you around. This is what it means to be addicted to sensual pleasures. This is the problem. And because of that, suffering follows you like water in a leaky boat. If the boat is leaky, the water comes in, and then when you move the boat, then the water follows along, yeah, because the water is inside the boat. So the water in the leaky boat always follows along. In the same way, if you desire and you lust over all the things in the world, suffering always follows you along with you. You have to look after these things. You're afraid of losing them. You want to control them. And the more you try to control, the worse it gets because you find that you cannot control it. And then you grieve when you lose it. And the kings, the tax man comes and takes his part. And the thieves of the world, they steal a bit from you. And the heirs who don't like you, they take their part. And it just endlessly goes on. And all kinds of problems that arise over these things. And remember, this is what the Buddha saw. This is that beautiful story that you find in the Arya Pariyasana Sutta, the Noble Search. This is where the Buddha talks about what happened to him before he gave up the lay life, the home life. What did the Buddha do? Well, he said, well, here I am. I myself am subject to old age. I'm subject to uh, dying and all of these kind of things. And when I am subject to dying, when I'm subject to old age, why should I cling to? Why should I desire all of these other things that also are subject to dying and old age and all of these things? It's, it's crazy. I already have enough problems with myself. I'm going to die. I already have these attachments to myself. And then I go attached to other things as well. The Buddha called it the ignoble search. We are searching for other things that compound the problem, compound the situation we're already in. And of course, because this was the Buddha to be, this was the Bodhisattva, he's going to become the Buddha in the future. He thinks, 
I'm not going to go on this ignoble search. I'm going to go on the noble search itself instead. The noble search, find a freedom from death, a freedom from old age, a freedom from attaching to all of these unreliable things in the world. This is exactly what the Buddha-to-be was thinking when he was a bodhisattva, when he started out the path, the other practice. So these, again, are very profound things. They can be very hard to see. And I don't know if you can relate to this, but it is worth investigating a little bit because when you investigate these things a little bit, it means that your attention changes a little bit. Your mind, mind is pointing in a slightly different direction. You become more interested in the spiritual life. And as you do that, less suffering is following along with you. Less suffering is coming in the foot tracks, coming in the, your footsteps, dragged along with you. Yeah, like the water in the leaky boat. And gradually, gradually, you're changing course in this way. So it is worth reflecting on, even if it is challenging. Yeah. And then the Buddha says, that is why a person ever mindful should avoid sensual pleasures, should avoid the sensual objects in the world. Give them up cross the flood as a bailed out boat reaches the far shore. So if you are mindful, yeah, always mindful, uh, you avoid those objects in the world. Uh, you avoid attaching to those things uh, because you know that once you attach to those things, uh, you're asking for suffering. You say, please, please, may I suffer? That's what you say every time you attach to something. Do you really want that suffering? Or would you like to let go of it instead? This is the big question for our lives. So you give them up and then you can cross the flood. The flood is the flood of samsaric existence. It is a flood because it is driven by craving. Craving always flowing on. And because craving flowing on, we are driven like slaves to craving in this world. Always working really hard, exerting ourselves. Yeah, And then one day... When we give up the right thing, we can cross that flood of craving in the world. You can reach the far shore like the bailed out boat. There's no water inside. You're no longer carrying the suffering with you. And you're free of all of these problems that almost everyone else in the world has. So... This next sutta is very similar. It's a very similar kind of theme. It is about the downside of sensual pleasures. And I have already spoken about these things in at quite a bit of length. But let's just um, quickly have a look at these things again. It's going to have only a couple of similes here. The whole sutta has seven similes. But I have uh, chosen two of them, which are kind of the most useful for uh, what we are talking about during this particular retreat. Uh, let's have a quick look at this. Uh, this is from the famous Potalia Sutta, Majjhimanakaya 54. Uh, famous for me anyway. I'm not sure if it's famous for everyone else, but for me, it's really famous. <laughs> okay. Suppose a vulture or a crow or a hawk was to grab a lump of meat and fly away. Other vultures, crows and hawks uh, would keep chasing it, pecking and clawing. What do you think, householder, if that vulture, crow or hawk doesn't quickly let go of that lump of meat, wouldn't that result in death or deadly or, or death-like suffering for them? Yes, sir. In the same way, a noble disciple reflects with a simile of the lump of meat, the Buddha has said that sensual pleasures give little gratification and much suffering and distress, and they are all the more full of drawbacks. Having truly seen this with right understanding, they reject equanimity based on diversity and develop only the equanimity based on unity, where all kinds of grasping to the world's material delights cease without anything left over. So this is one of my 
favorite similes. And I did sort of talk about this a little bit before, the same kind of ideas. I didn't mention the simile before, but I mentioned the ideas that are contained within this simile. So here is this idea. Yeah, you have a bird. It's a vulture, a crow, or a hawk. It doesn't matter what it is. And this bird gets hold of a lump of meat. And of course, a lump of meat is very valuable to a bird. It's very difficult for a bird to get hold of a lump of meat. Normally, they have to eat worms and they have to eat all kinds of insects and all kinds of yucky, yucky stuff. Yeah. So finally, you get hold of a lump of meat. And because you get hold of a lump of meat and you fly off, other birds will also want that lump of meat. So they come after that bird, they chase it, they peck and they claw, trying to grab hold of that lump of meat. Everybody wants the same lump of meat. Why? Because there is a shortage of meat in the world, especially for birds. It is a very rare thing to get hold of meat in the world. Yeah, and this is exactly what our human realm is like. There's a shortage of everything. Not everybody can live in a big mansion. Not everyone can have like five cars and uh, 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 you know, 10 servants or whatever. Not everyone can have the most beautiful wife. There is, you know, there's only, or a beautiful husband. We can only, there's only so many beautiful people around. Not everyone can have, be the boss of the company. Not everyone can earn huge amounts of money. There is a limited resources in the world. And because there is limited resource, resource in the world, we fight over these things. In the end, there is always competition. There's always winners and losers. There's always a sense of conflict in our society. And conflict arises out of the fact that the sensory realm is so limited. We are chasing the same things in this world. And this is what I was saying before. This is kind of the, such a downside of the sensory realm, that it is a realm that is always going to have conflict in it. It is built into the sensory realm. It is not something that can be escaped from in the sensory realm. Maybe we can reduce it a little bit by having good policies and good governments and, and these kind of things. But very often we have no power to decide the government anyway, so who knows what's going to happen. Yeah, it's kind of uncertain. But what we know that even if we can reduce it a little bit, even if we can head in the right direction, there's always a reducible element of conflict and violence in any kind of sensory realm. And I don't know about you, but to me, this is so, it's such a powerful insight, yeah? Because it means that the whole sensory realm in a very profound way is very unsatisfactory here. If it always leads to conflict, if it always leads to violence, if it leads to the invasion of Ukraine, if it leads to corruption and all of these crazy things that we have in our world everywhere, if we lead to people stealing the donations we give them because they are corrupt within the charity realm, if this is the nature of that world, then that world is much less interesting. The reason we think that there is hope in that world is we think that, well, actually, maybe the world will change. Maybe we can create a better world. And usually it is just hope. It's what they call the victory of hope over experience. Experience tells us this is not the way the world is going to be. But our hope, our desire, our craving, our attachments make us think that the world will be different. The world will not be different. The world will always be more of the same. If you look at human history, if you look at prehistory, if you go back to previous eons, yeah, just going by the suttas, it has always been the same. And it will always be the same in the future because this is the nature of the sensory realm. It's a very profound insight. It turns you off that world. If it is so full of conflict, if that is an irreducible fact, an irreducible reality of that world, actually, it is no longer so interesting. It turns you gradually away from that world. It makes you far more interested in the spiritual realm, because in the spiritual realm, there is no such conflict. As I was saying before, the spiritual realm is always private. 
It is what is happening inside of you. You're building up good quality within. within. There's no conflict there. There's no competition inside of you. It is just you developing good qualities for yourself. And then when you come out of that spiritual development, you actually help create harmony in the world because you have harmony inside of yourself. You have no need for those external things. So it's such a powerful way of thinking about the world. Yeah? And I think it has this great ability to point you in the right direction. Yeah? And if you don't let go, it says here, of that lump of meat, what does that bird get? Well, it gets death, or if it doesn't die, it gets a death-like suffering, very profound suffering. Yeah? Yeah, in the same way, if we hold on to the things in the world, we can expect a lot of suffering as a consequence. So the Buddha says that with the simile of the meat, sensual pleasures are just like that. They give little gratification, but much suffering and distress, and they are full of drawbacks. Having truly seen this with the right understanding, you reject the equanimity based on diversity and develop only equanimity based on unity. What does that mean? Well, it means that the equanimity based on diversity is like the even mind in the world. You are still in the world, you are still living among sensory pleasures, yeah, because the sensory pleasures are always around us. Right now, I am surrounded by a room, yeah, right here at Bodhinana Monastery. There are lights in here, there's a window over there, window, a couple of doors. These are all sensory objects. We live in that world. We are immersed in that world. And even if you can develop an even mind within that world, the Buddha says that is not enough. You are still too close to the grasping in that world. So what you want to do is you want to develop a deeper kind of equanimity, the equanimity based on unity. And the equanimity based on unity is the equanimity of samadhi, the equanimity that you find in the jhana states specifically the third and the fourth jhana, that is where you want to go, because then you go beyond the entire sensory world. That is kind of the idea here, because that is where all kinds of grasping to the world's material delights cease without any remainder. That is what the Buddha is saying. So uh, I don't know about you, but I find this very powerful. Yeah, it is so... And in a sense, we know it is true. This is exactly what the world is like. Yeah, it has this problem. We're always competing over these things. In fact, we live in a political system, a political ideology. Most of the world lives within a capitalist system where we are competing with each other. Now, the downside of the capitalist system is that capitalism is based on the idea of competition. Yeah, And whenever there is based on the idea of competition, because there are winners and losers, there will be conflict. And when there is conflict, eventually it will lead to violence and problems. And I think to me, that is the problem with this capitalist system, that it had, ultimately it has problems. I don't, I'm not saying that there is any better system. Maybe there is nothing better, but uh, the problem is still there. I'm not here to advocate politics or anything like that. I'm just saying that whatever you do in the world, there are downsides. So let's have a quick look at the last simile because uh, uh, this is one that I have talked about quite a bit already. So we can probably do it fairly quickly. Suppose a person was to see delightful parks, woods, meadows and lotus ponds in a dream. But when they woke up from that dream, they, could, they couldn't see them anymore. Yeah, this is what happens in dreams. In the same way, a noble disciple reflects. With a simile of the dream, the Buddha has said that sensual pleasures, the sensual objects of the world, give little gratification and much suffering and distress. They are all the more full of drawbacks. Yeah, I've spoken about this simile before, but... Uh, just in brief, you know, there's, there's different ways of thinking about these things. Uh, but one way of thinking about the simile of the dream is to think about what, when you think about a sensual object in your life, a relationship, a house or whatever, what it is like in the dream, 
what you think it will be like and the reality of what it actually is. And if you contemplate that carefully, you will see that there is a big difference between the two. In the dream, the relationship is so wonderful. It is so great. Yeah? In reality, it is much more ordinary. Yeah? In the dream, the perfect house. Well, it is perfect in the dream, but no, no house is perfect in reality. Yeah? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In the end, you realize life has the same problem. Yeah? And there's also other ways of thinking about the dream. And that was what I just mentioned before, earlier on in this verse. The idea that when... Uh, uh, you know, a person has died and they are no longer there, it is almost like they have become a dream to you. You have woken up from that dream. The person is gone. It's almost like, were they ever there? It's like they have disappeared. Everything becomes, starts to fade away. It doesn't seem real anymore in quite the same way. All the attachments of the past tend to look a little bit like dreams when you look back upon them. So the Buddha says, in the same way as a dream, the sensual objects of the world, there's a lot of suffering involved with these things. Having truly seen this with right understanding, they reject the equanimity based on diversity and develop the equanimity based on unity, where all kinds of grasping to the world's material delights cease without anything left over. All right, let's do another five minutes of meditation and then we'll come back to the Q&A at the very end. There.